Can we pray for us as we get started? Father in heaven, we pray that you would show us yourself more clearly in a more compelling way this morning. I pray that I would be your mouthpiece to speak to your people the words that you would have them hear and that your spirit would work in our lives to help us receive these words from you, to see how good you are, how true these words are, and how much we need to hear them ourselves and to respond to them. So I pray that I would get out of the way this morning, and that you would speak to your people, and you'd build us up for our good and your glory through your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. He had lost it all, squandered it, all his money gone, even his nest egg. He did have some family who might be able to support him, but he had burned bridges with them long ago. He was selfish. He had been stupid. And now he had nothing. He got a job feeding pigs, but it was hard to do even that work because his belly was aching with hunger. and Even that pig food looked appetizing. This was a man who had hit rock bottom. He was stuck and he could not fix the mess that he had gotten himself into. He could not go back and undo what he had done or do anything to atone for his mistakes. His only hope was that maybe if he came clean with his family, if he owned up to his past, maybe he could get a second chance. Maybe, he thought, my father will let me work the land with his servants. And then over time, I could gradually repay some of these wrongs and rebuild some trust with him. So the man made the long trip home as he approached his childhood home. His father spotted him through the window. He sprinted out to him. And when he got there, he embraced him. And he kissed his stinky head. The man began to apologize. But as soon as he started doing this, his father interrupted him, shouting to his servants, bring me the best robe quickly. Put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and some shoes. Go, kill the fattened calf. Get it on the grill. My son was dead, but today he is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. The fields, they can wait. Today, we celebrate. What an amazing father. And that same father is waiting for you today. He is looking out the window to see if you're coming home to him. He knows that you have strayed from him. He knows you have gotten yourself into trouble. And he knows that you're suffering as a result. But he is not thinking right now. I told him, I told her they were going the wrong way. They should have listened to me. No, God is thinking, I miss my boy. I miss my little girl. And I just want them to come home. Your heavenly father is not expecting you to bring him a gift. He's not expecting you to clean yourself up first. He just wants you to come home. And if you go to him and you ask for mercy, he will forgive you. He will. And then we, he will give to you far better than what you deserve. Because he is a loving father. He always wants what's best for you. Guilt, shame, these things weigh all of us down every day of our lives. We all are living with regrets. 
some serious, some more minor, about some of the decisions that we've made in our lives. There are things that we are even too ashamed to name that we know that we've done. And this guilt and this shame, it is crushing us under its weight. And it is keeping us from the very people who could help us because we are too ashamed to let them see who we have become and what we have done. But our compassionate Father knows exactly who we are and exactly what we have already done. And that is why he urges us to come back home. He is not looking to lecture us. He is looking to take this terrible burden off of our shoulders. He is looking to take our misery away. He is looking to restore the joy of being his child. God's heart overflows with compassion for your suffering, even for the suffering that you have brought upon yourself. His mercy is waiting for you, and he longs to give it to you because he loves you. He loves you, and he wants you back. Today, we are going to lean into our discomfort as we reflect on some of the regrets that we have, the things that we've done that make us even today feel guilty and ashamed of how foolish and stupid and wrong we were. Not only our mistakes, but our moral failures as well. Even those ones that are so big, we can't get ourselves to admit them aloud. But as we do this, we are also going to hear our Father pleading with us to come home so he can lift these burdens off of our shoulders and care for us once more. So we take a look at our text, Psalm 32. We're going to see three things. First, we're going to see the ugliness, the great ugliness of our sin. This will then accent the second thing that we're going to see, which is the great beauty of God's mercy. And then finally, we'll see that there is a great choice, a great decision that we must make. The great ugliness of our sin, the great beauty of God's mercy, the great decision we must make. King David wrote this psalm sometime after his infamous sin with Bathsheba. And for centuries, Christians have found this Psalm, Psalm 32, to be especially helpful to them on their own spiritual journey. In the early church, this was one of seven penitential psalms of repentance that Christians would sing together on Ash Wednesday each year. It was a way that they would start to prepare their hearts for Easter. Augustine had this psalm posted on the wall beside his deathbed. He wanted to frequently remember to confess his sins to God and to go to God for mercy as he's provided it in Christ. That's what he wanted to do in his days as he was preparing to meet his maker. Now, you may know that Augustine himself wrote a book called Confessions, where he goes into detail on some of the sins in his life and offers them to God in forgiveness and in, in confession. Augustine once said, the beginning of knowledge is to know oneself to be a sinner. But what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to sin? Why does the Bible talk so much about sin? Why do Christians talk so much about sin? Well, you cannot see the true beauty of the cross unless you first get a glimpse of the true ugliness of sin. And here in Psalm 32, as David recalls his sin, we get a little bit a more detailed picture of sin's true ugliness. This is what he says, verses 1 to 5. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. 
My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. First thing we need to know about sin is that sin is not one kind of thing. Sin is wrong on many different levels. And on each level, we can get another glimpse of how it is so ugly and undesirable. At one level, sin is hata, which means to miss the mark. That's the word David uses in verses 2 and 5 that gets translated sin. Hata is when we fail to accomplish what God expects, when we fail to live up to God's standard. We miss the mark. And we see throughout the Bible that we are not people who have missed the mark by this much in our lives. We are people who have been way off base, way off the mark. If there was a target there and the bullseye was the aim, we spend our days shooting the arrow in this direction. Instead of loving our neighbor sacrificially like Jesus, we don't love our neighbor sacrificially like Paul. We hate our neighbor. We turn against our neighbor. We try to cheat our neighbor. We are way off the mark so often. If God's standard is a home run, all we can manage is a strikeout on three pitches. It is a pathetic display that we put on of righteousness. Our behavior is way out of line. We are not like Jesus, that's for sure. On another level, sin is avon, which gets translated iniquity in verses 2 and 5. Avon portrays sin as a kind of corruption, as a twistedness, as a crookedness. It describes how we sometimes deface the glory of God's image upon us by twisting our God-given will so that we who were made to worship and serve God decide we are going to worship creation and serve ourselves. It's a twistedness to sin. We are not who God made us to be. We are not functioning how God made us to function. Our hearts are so warped by sin that they keep pumping out idol after idol after idol. And our minds are so twisted that we go around defending ourselves with all manner of excuses for our behavior. So just so we can live with ourselves, as we spend our days serving ourselves and lusting after God's created things. We are all marked and marred by sin's corruption. Just consider the thoughts that come into your head and the deepest desires of your heart. We sin because we are sinners by nature. And some part of us loves to sin. On a third level, sin is transgression, pesha. A transgression as an act of willful rebellion. Whenever we sin, we are living as if we are the true king. That's why whoever else we may be sinning against as we sin, our sins are first and foremost sins against God himself. The old Scottish pastor Alexander McLaren said, you do not understand the gravity of the most trivial wrong act when you think of it as a sin against the order of nature or against the law written on your heart or as the breach of the constitution of your own nature or as a crime against your fellows. You have not got to the bottom of the blackness until you see that it is a flat rebellion against God himself. What makes this rebellion in sin even more offensive and inexcusable and ugly is that this God that we are rebelling against is so good to us. He gives us so many good things. He feeds us. He clothes us. He is more kind to us than our best friend is. And he's always like this with us. And how do we respond to this kindness from God? We try to overthrow his reign. 
by despising and disregarding the glory of his kingdom and insisting to him and to ourselves, hey, we would be much better off living in a kingdom that was how we wanted it to work. A kingdom where we were the boss, where everybody did our will, rather than in this kingdom. We have dishonored God. We have treated God's love like it is no big deal. Who cares? We have rejected God's rule and we've tried to crown ourselves the true king, the rightful king of our life. We have transgressed God's commands, many times on purpose, in an effort to overthrow his reign and install ourselves as king. Because we love to play God. Sin isn't a mistake, nor is it just a momentary lapse in someone's judgment. As we sin, we are really turning away from God, away from God's good design for us. And we are turning from his constant love like it means nothing to us. We are resisting his rule like it's not real. We are trying to overthrow his reign like we should get to decide what goes on in our life. Through sin, we say to God, I do not need you. I do not need your rules. Your rules are stupid. I don't owe you anything. Let my kingdom come. Let my will be done in my life. Please, God, let me pray to you. Would you do my will? Sin is ugly. And so are the emotions that we feel when we come to sense the ugliness of what we've actually done. We hate how sin makes us look to ourselves and to others once we come to see it. Because sin hangs the weight of guilt upon our conscience. It makes us feel ashamed and embarrassed. And as we carry around this guilt and this shame, they make our life miserable. They take the joy out of our life. Our only way to find joy is to try to distract ourselves from reality. Here David says his guilt and shame felt like when your strength is being sapped by the summer sun and, and you feel like it's too hard to even keep going because the guilt and shame are this unbearable, uncarryable weight upon your shoulders. When guilt and shame are hanging over your conscience, it's like your bones are being crushed into fine powder. Day and night, you groan under their weight. And so long as you have this weight on your chest, you feel weak and unhappy and unsatisfied. But why is that? It's because deep down, you are anxious about your personal future. You are anxious about what's going to happen to you when word gets out what you did. You're anxious about how people are going to think about you and how they're going to respond to you. You're anxious that God is now out to get you. So just as there is joy to be found in having a clean conscience, a guilty conscience is a source of anxiety and ongoing suffering in our lives. Guilt and shame always lay heavy on our shoulders. And the longer we carry this burden, the heavier it comes to feel. If you pretend all is well, that you're doing fine because you're afraid to let your sins out into the light of day, what you're doing is you're responding to your anxiety by avoiding it. And this only reinforces this belief in your mind that you have something to be hot that you have something to hide, that you are not acceptable, that you are not able to be seen, that you are no good, that you are inferior, and that you deserve to be punished, that no one could really accept who you are and what you have really done, so you need to hide. This only increases your anxiety and your shame. It spirals down, down. You become less intimate with other people. You can't be honest with other people. You get more isolated. You feel more lonely. You start to withdraw from the very people who could help you. Because that's what sin does. 
Sin separates us from God and from others. It erodes our relationship by driving a wedge into our relationships. It draws us away from community and keeps us from the great joy of intimacy. It leads us on a downward spiral of shame, guilt, and anxiety that siphons off the joys of life as it destroys our relationships, our lives, and the lives of the people around us. But God is offering us something better. God wants to set us free from the deadly spiral of sin. He wants to put an end to our isolation. He wants to restore our joy. And that's why God in his love is calling us to the hard but precious work of ongoing regular confession. Confession unlocks the floodgates of God's mercy, and it paves the way not only to forgiveness, but to true reconciliation. So listen to what happened to David when he confessed these sins to God that had been hanging heavy on his shoulders. He says in verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. When David came clean to God about what he had done, God did not crush him, but lifted him up. In our shame, we tell ourselves that if our sins get out, we will be crushed. So we go to great lengths to not let those sins see the light of day. And if they start to peek out, we go to great lengths to try to excuse them. The last thing we ever want to do in life as a sinner is voluntarily confess our sin to someone, let alone confess it to the judge himself. But the good news is that the judge of heaven is a merciful God. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All our sins he will forgive. Every last vestige of our unrighteousness, all our guilt, all our shame, he will cleanse it. David says in Psalm 103, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. There is good news for the guilty. There is hope for those who are living in shame. Your judge will forgive all your sins, cleanse all your guilt and all your shame. If you will turn from your sin and turn to him in faith and confess your sins and put your hope in his mercy. Because God is merciful. God is willing to pardon us. God delights in pardoning us. We must first be humble enough to admit we even need it. And also have enough faith to believe that if we approach him in the filthiness of our sin, and we confess our sins to him, that he will not crush us. But he will cleanse us of all our unrighteousness. And he will lift that heavy weight of shame off our shoulders. Here David sets an example for us by offering God a full confession. He notes his sin, his iniquity, and his transgressions against God. The principle here is that we must fess up to what we've truly done as we confess. It's it's that we can't downplay our sin or excuse our sin 
as we go to God for forgiveness, that we need to own it, that we need to admit our guilt before him. We need to come clean with whatever is on our conscience and give a full confession of our sins without ignoring them, without downplaying them, without making excuses for them. David describes this in verse 2 as having no deceit in your spirit. You're not trying to deceive God as you confess by papering over what you did or by shifting the blame onto somebody else. Real confession needs to be honest and truthful with no deceit. We need to own what we've done and humbly confess it for the sin that it is. Even though the very thought of doing this scares us to death. But God reassures us that if we turn to him in faith for mercy, confessing our sins, calling upon him for mercy, that he will give us mercy. He promises. Notice here that just as David's confession is threefold, God's mercy is also threefold. In verses 1 and 5, we find the term that we're expecting, forgive how sweet it is to be forgiven by someone else. Blessed, happy is the person who finds God's forgiveness, David says. But before we consider some of the blessings of being forgiven by God, I want to point out two other ways that God's forgiveness is portrayed here. In verse 2, David describes this as God not counting our iniquities. Now, counting is an accounting term. The idea is that our judge has a list of all of our sin debts. But when we come to him in faith and we confess our sins and ask for his mercy, he cancels all our debts. So we are no longer under an obligation to repay our debt of sin to him. God wipes the slate clean. All David does here is confess that he needs God. That he needs God's mercy. Because he has sinned. And just that leads the God of mercy to immediately forgive every single one of his debts. God doesn't give him a to-do list that he needs to go out and accomplish. God simply grants him mercy. Because David has come to him as a sinner who is ready to repent of his sin and confess to God that he needs mercy. That is enough to move the God of mercy to cancel David's entire debt of sin. Now, does that imply that sin is not actually all that big of a deal, that God can just sweep it under the rug? Not at all. In fact, God cannot simply sweep our sins under the rug as if they never happened. Sin is wrong. Sin must be punished or there will be no justice in this world. And God is too just to simply look the other way and ignore offenses that deserve punishment. So how can he cancel our debts? It is because God himself has paid them off. David alludes to this in verse 1 where he said, Blessed is the man whose sin is covered. That's the third word David uses to describe God's beautiful mercy here. Cover. Cover is an important word in the Bible. It's the word that gets used in the Old Testament to describe atonement for sin. Sin needs to be punished. God, justice needs to be served. God is rightly angry because of our sin. And God is too just to sweep it under the rug. He must punish it. But God also wants to save his people from the punishment they deserve. He doesn't want to see them destroyed. So God told the Israelites that if they sinned, they could bring an animal to the temple and make a sacrifice. And the animal's spilled blood would then atone for their sin. But in the, Old Te in the New Testament, we see that this was really only an early picture of how atonement would actually end up working. That true and full atonement for sin would come only to the cross itself, as God himself dies for his people to pay the full penalty for their sins against him. God came in the person of Jesus Christ to cover our sins in his blood, to pay off our debt of sin in full, to serve the sentence justice demands of us, 
so that in the day of judgment, he might save us from his own wrath. In the end, God himself pays the price to cover our sin. So he would not need to count our iniquities against us on that day. That's why we can find mercy as we confess our sins to God. Jesus' payment on the cross is more than enough to cover all our sins, even the very worst sins. And God is more than able and more than happy to transfer the debts from your ledger onto Christ's ledger so that his atoning death might pay for all of those sins. If you want to see the true beauty of mercy, you've got to look at the mercy tree where God himself died for your sins so you could live despite your sins. See the beauty of his mercy. Your God not only offers you forgiveness, but he has come here to pay for your sins in full so he could grant you mercy upon mercy upon mercy for each and every thing you do wrong. For every way that you wrong and dishonor him. We worship a God who runs after his lost children and embraces them when they return home empty-handed and ashamed. We worship a God who rejoices every time his children come home, even when they have dishonored him. We worship a God who accepts us despite our sin through the cross work of Jesus Christ and washes off the stains of our shame. There is no greater blessing than to be reconciled to him as your father. Listen as David mentions just some of the blessings he is now enjoying as a forgiven man who has now come home and been reconciled to his merciful father. Verse six and following. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer to you at a time, offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. The righteous person David is exhorting here is not the person who is righteous because they've never sinned. It is the person who has sinned and yet has been forgiven and made righteous by the God of mercy. The righteous person is the person who has become righteous by the mercy and grace of God through the atonement that Jesus Christ would ultimately make for them on the cross. That person has seen the beauty of God's great mercy. And because of this, they are not only happy and blessed, but they are glad. They can rejoice and shout for joy with David. Because God embraces them. Because God's love surrounds them, as David says in verse 10. That person can rejoice because God has released them from the shackles of sin and shame and guilt. For as he shouted from the cross, it is finished. That person can rejoice because God is now graciously guiding them into what is good. Verse 8. He's giving them refuge from evil. Verse 7. The mercy of God is bountiful, transformative, and beautiful. And God is offering this mercy to you today. God is urging you today to turn to him in your sin and cry out for his mercy so he might forgive you 
and wash your shame away. And the greatest decision you or I will ever make in life is how we will respond to God's invitation. Will you embrace God's offer of forgiveness in Christ? Whether for the first time or the thousandth time in your life. Or will you respond today by saying, no thanks, I'm good. And telling yourself, it's all going to be fine. I don't need this. In verse 6, David urges us to confess our sins to God as soon as possible, while his mercy is still available to us. He says, therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. Mercy can be yours today if you will confess your sins to God and trust him to forgive you through the death of Christ for your sins. But that mercy may not be available to you tomorrow. It's a limited time offer. Because once the great waters of judgment start pouring down upon this earth as King Jesus returns to judge the world and install his kingdom in its fullness, at that point, your prayer for mercy will be too late. It will not reach him. The offer will be off the table. And you don't know when that day is. So do not take this decision lightly, to be sure. There is no more important decision you will make in your life than this one. But do not put it off either and think you're going to deal with this when you get old and you're preparing to die. The God who loves you is ready right now to wipe the slate clean and forgive your sins. He is ready to take the burden of guilt off your shoulders and wash your shame completely away. He is offering you a fresh start and new life in Christ. So cry out for his mercy today. If you will own up to the ugliness of your sin, bring it to God in prayer and confess those sins as you turn away from those old ways and you decide that you're going to try to follow Jesus. By God's grace, you will receive his beautiful mercy and all the wonders and blessings of Christ's salvation will become yours. If you come home, God will take you in his arms. He will embrace you. He will kiss you. He will have a party in heaven to celebrate your return because he wants nothing more than to forgive your sins so he can have you back home. It's time to come back home. Don't be afraid. Your sins, they may be many, but his mercy is even more. Your sins, they may be ugly, but God delights in you still. He still wants you as his child. This God you're thinking about going to, he already knows exactly what you've done. You're not going to surprise him with anything at all. And knowing that he still loves you right now more than anyone else does. As Tim Keller puts it, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Heavenly Father, your offer to us sounds too good to be true. It sounds too easy that you would just forgive us without us doing things for you or making it up to you or accomplishing things. But this is what your word says to us, and we pray that you'd help us to believe it. This good news would not be too good to be true, but it would be news that we would believe and respond to in faith by going to you for mercy in all our dirtiness and shame and letting you take our sins away and wash us clean. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.